Today we're going to be studying the function w equal to f of z defined as w being z to the n, where n is some positive integer. In this case, in this structure, z is something that we'd call an nth root of w. So we want to study this function as well as the possibility of defining a continuous inverse function z equal to w to the 1 by n. Our approach will be to study the function w equal to z squared. That's a very simple case of z to the n. And we'll use our knowledge to extend cases of higher n. Similarly, we'll be studying the possibility of a continuous inverse z equal to w to the 1 half or z equal to the square root of w. Now, to analyze this function, if we had a real valued function y equal to f of x, as in a real valued function of a single variable, we'd only need two perpendicular axes, one for the x values and one for the y values, that would suffice to visually study the function y equal to f of x. But for the case of complex valued functions, it gets a lot more complicated because each complex number needs two real numbers to specify it, one for the real part and one for the imaginary part. But don't worry, we're not exactly going to be drawing tesseracts, we're just going to be drawing two complex planes. I'm going to call one plane the z plane and the other the w plane. And the entire point of having two complex planes is to study how curves in the z plane transform into different curves in the w plane under w equals z squared. So let's look at a certain type of curve in the z plane. Let's focus our attention on the half plane REZ being positive. And this restriction on the real part of z enforces a restriction on the argument of z. This implies that the argument of z will be bound between pi by 2 and negative pi by 2. And let's focus our attention further on a restriction that the modulus of z is some fixed positive r. Now what does a curve in the z plane satisfying these restrictions look like? Well, it would look like a semicircle where it's understood that we're excluding the values on the imaginary axis. Now, how exactly does the semicircle transform under w equals z squared? Well, let's see exactly what happens when we apply the transform. So, invoking the polar form of z, we have r times e to the i phi. Squaring it means that we have r squared times e to the 2 i phi. And this little equation here is very insightful. It's really insightful because it shows some valuable information for the restrictions on the w variable using restrictions on the z variable. For example, it shows us that the absolute value of z is actually the absolute value of z. Uh, the, the absolute value of w is actually the absolute value of z squared. And it also shows that the argument of w is just twice the argument of z. So if this is how we restricted the argument for the z variable, the corresponding restriction for the argument of w will be bounding it between negative and positive pi. So if the modulus of w equals z squared, so that means it's r squared, and if the argument of w is restricted to be between pi and negative pi, what shape does this invoke on the w plane? Well, that's easy it invokes a circle. So the radius of the circle, the radius of the circle is gonna be r squared, and we're traversing the circle in the anti-clockwise manner, and we stop just short of the negative real axis, and that's obviously, that's obviously something very difficult to draw, so instead of leaving a little space here, we'll just show a branch cut. So the branch cut excludes the origin as well as the negative real axis. And then we continue our circular motion with the argument increasing from negative pi to zero. So what's happened is that the half plane REZ being positive 
has been mapped onto the slit plane, that is the complex plane excluding negative infinity all the way up to zero. That is pretty damn cool, no doubt. But that was just one half plane. What about the other half plane that is the case for REZ being negative? Now this restriction on the real part of Z invokes a different restriction on the argument. So the argument of Z in this case is bounded between 3 pi by 2 and pi by 2. And again, let's study exactly what happens to uh, the curve shown in the Z plane under the transformation W equals Z squared. Again, we have W equal to R squared times E to the 2 I phi. So again, we have the absolute value of W being the square of the absolute value of Z. So that in the case of the curve we're considering would be R squared. And in this case, once again, we see that the argument of W is twice the argument of Z. So the corresponding restriction on the argument of W would be bounding it between 3 pi and pi. But being bound between 3 pi and pi is the same as being bound between pi and negative pi, right? So that means we have exactly the same curve in the z plane as before. So the semicircle is once again mapped onto this circular path. And again, we have this branch cut along the negative real axis and zero. So the half plane REZ is less than zero is mapped also to the slit plane C difference negative infinity to zero. The mapping of both the open half planes onto the exact same set, that is the slit plane C excluding negative infinity to zero, allows us to draw some intuitive conclusion that it, each non-zero W is mapped onto exactly two non-zero Zs. So that means the mapping W equals Z squared is not injective. And if it's not injective, this implies that the inverse mapping Z equal to W to the one half is multivalued, which is equivalent to saying that this equation, where we know that on the right-hand side, Z would be called a square root of W, this means that there are two square roots of W. And we just saw this visually, but we can see it just as easily analytically by, again, drawing out the complex plane and considering two vectors here. One represents a complex number z, and another is a complex number z prime of equal absolute value. And you get from z to z prime by rotating in the clockwise manner by pi radians. So what would be the square of z? Well, z squared would be r squared times e to the 2 i phi. What about z prime squared? Well, they both have the same absolute value. So again, you have r squared times e to the i phi. A rotation by pi radians in the clockwise manner means you have a negative pi here, and you're squaring this. Now, the square introduces e to the 2 i phi minus pi which is equivalent to saying that we have r squared times e to the i 2 phi minus 2 pi, and this equals r squared times e to the 2 i phi minus 2 pi i, which is equivalent to having r squared times e to the 2 i phi times e to the negative 2 pi i, which we know and love as 1. So this implies that z prime squared equals r squared times e to the 2 i phi, which is exactly what z squared is. So we see that both z and z prime are mapped onto the exact same complex number, r squared times e to the 2 i phi. By a similar token, we can see that there are n nth roots of any non-zero complex number w, and we can find them quite easily using the polar forms of w and z. So let's write out z, uh, let's write out w, as rho times e to the i theta, and the z's here would be r times e to the i phi, again, going clockwise from one root to another, we have a negative sign, and each root would be separated by 2 pi by n radians, correct? And we can count the number of rotations it takes to go from the first root to the kth 
root or the k minus one root by k. Yeah, that seems about right. And the values of k here would be 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. So k equal to 0 represents the first nth root. k equal to 1 represents the second. And if you go n minus 1 jumps or n minus 1 clockwise rotations, you get to the nth root. And another rotation by 2 pi by n radians takes you all the way back to the first root at k equal to zero, because that way you complete a circle of two pi radians. And we're raising all of this to the n. So this means that we have r to the n times e to the i n times phi minus two pi by n times k. Now we can expand the exponential terms using Euler's formula and then equate the real and imaginary parts and then conclude that r would be rho to the 1 by n. And similarly for phi, we have phi, oh wait a second, this was theta over here, terribly sorry about that. We have theta equal to n times phi minus 2 pi by n times k, which implies that phi equals theta by n plus 2 pi k by n, where k varies accordingly. So that is done and dusted with. So we conclude that the n and roots of w would be equal to the modulus of w to the 1 by n, that's the rho variable, I'm oh, terribly sorry about that, times e to the i times theta by n, where theta is the argument of the w, plus 2 pi k by n. And wait a second, this should be z sub k. Yes, exactly. So we characterize, we identify each nth root by the index k, and k here can be 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. And that's how you figure out the n nth roots of any complex number w. And in case w equals 1, then the z's are called the nth roots of unity. Quick recap time, we just saw that w equal to z to the n is not injective, which means that z equal to w to the 1 by n is multi-valued, and hence it's not continuous. So we now want to return to the question of determining a continuous inverse function by considering the simple case of w equal to z squared. Now for the inverse mappings, let's, let's, uh, bring back those two complex planes. For the inverse mappings, we're going from the W plane to the Z plane. And there are two ways to go about this, as we see. So we could define the inverse mapping by Z equal to W to the 1 half, where the argument of W is bound between pi and negative pi. That way, everything is nice and single-valued. Another way to define the inverse mapping is using the diagram below, where the real part of z is negative. Now, each complex number over here is the negative of some complex number here, correct? So this can be considered as the negative square root. So we could define this as z equal to uh, the negative square root of w, where again the argument of w is bound between pi and negative pi, and we take this branch to be the positive square root. Oh, terribly sorry about that. Why am I considering root pi or equivalently root 3? So these are two branches of the square root function. And this one here is the principal branch, the positive square root. Similarly, we could define the nth root. So a nice single-valued nth root would be z equal to w to the 1 by n, where the argument of w is bound between pi and negative pi. Now, let's check whether this mapping is continuous, and thankfully it is, because the branch cut takes care of any discontinu uh, discontinuities. Again, we have our friends, the z and w planes, and this time we're considering the transformation w equal to the square root of z. 
Okay, and in order for the square root function to be single-valued, we introduced a restriction on the argument of the input variable, which in this case is z. And that restriction is enforced by this branch cut, excluding the negative real axis as well as the origin. And in case anyone's worried about the origin, why are we excluding it so much? Why is there so much hate towards the origin? Well, there is no hate whatsoever. Uh, the square of zero as well as the square root are defined in the traditional sense, right? So this is just zero, which means that we've defined w of zero to be zero. And the square root of zero is, of course, zero. So yeah, nothing special with the zero of the complex realm. Anyway, getting back to the transformation from the z-plane to the w-plane, we saw exactly what happens to a circle in the z-plane, right? This will be transformed into a semicircle of radius being the square root of the radius in the z-plane. Okay, cool. And let me just deconstruct this a bit more by introducing two straight lines infinitesimally close to the negative real axis and call this upper line the positive line and this lower line the negative line. Now this upper line, this positive line, will be mapped onto the positive imaginary axis, correct? And this negative line will be mapped onto the negative imaginary axis. Okay, cool. So what's happening here is that if you approach the negative real axis from below, then what you get in the W plane is W equal to negative I times the square root of R. This is what you approach in the W plane. And as you approach the negative real axis from above in the W plane, you approach positive I times the square root of R, where I really should have used arrows instead to demonstrate that we're approaching something in a limit. So the only discontinuity here is because of the negative real axis, and we've excluded that from our definition of the square root and the nth root functions. So with the only discontinuity removed, that means the functions we've defined to be the square root and the nth root function in general are both continuous functions, which is pretty damn cool. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. As an exercise, I'd like you to try whatever I tried in the video using the function w equal to z cube instead. I want you to study this function analogous to how I studied the square case. And now for some homework. For today's homework, we need Gamelin's text, exercise 1.2, questions 1, 3, 4, and 7, as well as exercise 1.5, questions 1, 2, and 3. It'll be great if you hit the like and subscribe buttons to support the channel. You can DM me on Instagram in case you need any help with the homework problems. And in case you're interested in some tough math for fun, subscribe to my main channel, Maths505. All the relevant links are in the description box. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you. See you next time.